Our second speaker is Professor Eric Grove, who started his academic career in the field of uh, strategic studies and naval history uh, at the Royal Naval College in Dartmouth in 1971. Uh, then he founded the Russian-UK-US Naval Discussions and Confidence Building Talks in 1988. And currently, after his retirement, he's a lecturer at the Joint Services Command and Staff College and acts as a visiting supervisor at Cambridge. Today, Professor Grove with, will uh, talk about the division of labor between the Royal Navy Carrier Force and the RAF Strategic Strike Force in the post-war years. By 1945, naval air power was a major part of Britain's air striking capability. As David Hobbs puts it, the effective strike operations carried out by the British Pacific Fleet in 1945 against Japanese strategic, industrial, military and naval targets drew the Royal Navy into a new era of warfare. It had been the only British strike force capable of attacking mainland Japan and had done so with an economy of manpower and effort that should have demonstrated to post-war British governments how a maritime strategy could be deployed in the nation's best interests in the world. Things didn't quite turn out that way. One existential reason was that much of this combat capability, no less than two-thirds of carrier complements, was based on American lend-lease equipment that had never been paid for. Given the dollar shortage, there was no way these could be kept in service, and these aircraft had to be disposed of, often by being simply thrown over the side. It could be argued that the British did a decision to emphasise the land-based RAF as the centrepiece of, of its air power, a decision defensible, given the history of World War II, meant that Britain just could not afford this and a full-scale carrier force. Almost all the Corsairs, Avengers, Hellcats and Wildcats were disposed of by August 1946, the month the last Corsair squadron disbanded. The Royal Navy now regarded naval air power as a vital and integral part of the fleet. As a sign of this, in 1946, the term fleet air arm was officially replaced by naval aviation. Plans for new carriers were ambitious when the war ended, with four large 46,900-ton ships uh, projected, Malta, New Zealand, Gibraltar and Africa, and three rather smaller 36,800-ton audacious-class fleet, fleet carriers laid down and under construction. And the latter were improved versions of existing armoured hangar fleet carrier design. The larger ships, though, were, were different. At the request of the naval aviators, they were based on the American open hangar type so that large strikes of piston-engined aircraft could be warmed up. This delayed their design, fatally as it turned out. None, none was under construction by the war's end and two, Gibraltar and Africa, already suspended, were immediately cancelled. Under pressure for further cuts, the Admiralty accepted the cancellation of the other two ships of the class at the end of the year. Also cancelled was the third Audacious, the quarter-complete Eagle. Audacious was renamed Eagle, uh, to keep the name alive, an Ark Royal was retained under her original name. During the war, the British had pioneered the light fleet carrier, smaller 13,000 tonne vessels that could easily be built quite rapidly on mercantile ways. 16 were ordered, of which 10 were commissioned uh, by 1946, two as aircraft maintenance ships. One, the name ship of the class, Colossus, was transferred to France to make up for partly for uh, for Mez el Kabir and to provide a carrier to substitute for the, for the British troubled Indochina. Venerable went to the Netherlands in 1948, again to bolster a colonial power's position in the Far East. Warrior was loaned to Canada in 1946 for two years to assist in launching the RCN's fleet air arm. Glory, Ocean, Theseus and Triumph uh, therefore uh, provided the backbone of the immediate post-war RN carrier force being economical to operate and able to deploy a small but significant fighter-bomber air group of 24 to 28 aircraft, a mix of sea fires and fireflies. The last six of the original order were of a slightly modified Majestic class design with, with centralised messing facilities and the ability to operate aircraft of up to £20,000. Building of these ships was slowed down. Three were put in a state of preservation in May 1946 with their contracts cancelled. A Majestic herself remain suspended so her builders, vicars, could concentrate on merchantmen. Only two were completed in this period. Magnificent replaced Warrior in Canada in 1948 and Terrible went to Australia as HMAS Sydney the same year. A still larger light fleet carrier, the 18,310-tonne Hermes class, was also under construction. Four were cancelled, but Albion, Bulwark and Centaur were launched in 1947-48, though completion was seriously delayed because of a shortage of electrical design staff. 
This class would not be completed until 1953-4. Hermes herself was, was delayed indefinitely because of Vickers' merchant ship commitments. The, the completion of these, of these vessels, plus the two fleet carriers, was further delayed because of the need to improve their aircraft handling equipment to take, to take new, new types and shortages in design staff to do so. It had been hoped to, to complete both in 1948, but this had to be put back eventually with Eagle to 1951, and Ark Royal would not commission until 1955. The importance of these ships uh, was that, that they had been built to operate aircraft weighing up to 30,000 pounds, notably the new strike aircraft, the single-engine Fairy Spearfish, and the twin-engine Short Sturgeon, supplemented by a navalised Mosquito. The emphasis was on range rather than outright performance. The plan to Planned totals of these types were, uh, was about 200, together with 80 to 100 rather smaller Blackburn Firebrand single-seat torpedo bombers. The fighter force would be 385 aircraft, Sea Fires, Fireflies, twin-engine Sea Hornets, Sea Furies, uh, and eventually the large Western Wyvern, which was having serious development difficulties. At this point, the Wyvern seems to have been thought of as a long-range fighter, uh, rather than the, the Firebrand torpedo fighter a replacement it later became. The Wyvern's problems led, led to an order for 150 Seafang fighters, a naval version of the Spikeful as a stopgap. There was also a ferry design for a tandem turboprop strike fighter, N1645. The problem with this programme was that the latest aircraft type simply wouldn't fit into the existing fleet carriers. Either they were too wide or heavy for the lifts or too tall for the hangars. Illustrious, intended as a deck landings trial carrier, had its lift, barriers and arrest gear modified in 1945-46 to take 20,000 pound aircraft, but it was still limited in the types it could operate. With 30,000 pound carriers still years away and the Treasury crying out for savings, the Sturgeon and Spearfish were effectively cancelled as operational types. The Sea Fang went in 1946 and the Fairy Strike Fighter designed the following year. The firebrand was so troublesome that the 1st Squadron 813 disbanded after a year trying to cope with the aircraft in 1945-6, reforming with a new version in 1947, but the squadron only became fully operational in 1949. In August 1946, naval air strength was down to a mere 122 op operational aircraft, little more than 10% of the total a year before. Even of this total, the Sea Fire fighters were temporarily banned from carriers because of supercharger problems. No carriers were deployed that month. Three light fleet carriers, Glory, Ocean and Theseus, were back at sea in September, but with temporary all Firefly air, air groups. The two-seaters provided a useful, if low-performance, general-purpose capability, but this was hardly a powerful striking force. The, the sea fires were back by the end of the year, improving air-to-air -air capability at least. The most powerful operational RN strike aircraft was the Sea Mosquito TR-33, which appeared in April 1946, but was unable to operate from any carriers and its parent formation, 811 Squadron, disbanded in July 1947 after service ashore. In 1947, the Chiefs of Staff decided that war was unlikely in the next five years, although the danger would grow to 1957. Fleet planners therefore accepted a fleet capable of training and maintaining... Uh, fleet planners therefore accepted a fleet capable of training and maintaining overseas commitments. Refits to carriers would be... Uh, would be reduced to, to a minimum, an old aircraft like, like the Barracuda used. The second line 724 Barracuda ASW Training Squadron was duly reformed as an operational ASW squadron, number 815, and operated from carriers on exercises for some years. A replacement would be limited to those aircraft of all types that were completely worn out. The economic crisis of 1947 saw much of the fleet temporarily, temporarily immobilised at the end of the year. There was only one operational carrier, Triumph, in the Mediterranean, with 12 sea fires and 16 fire fireflies embarked. 1948 saw something of a recovery in the context of the beginning of the Cold War. The four skull was set at, at one fleet carrier, HMS Implacable, or already modified as a deck, la a deck landing training ship and capable of operating most available aircraft. Uh, she was given a limited refit in 1948-9 to restore her to fully operational capability with a total of up to 49 aircraft. Illustrious was refitted in 1948 to double as trials and training carrier and Indomitable began a refit to replace Implacable. There would also be four light fleets, each with 25 aircraft. Implacable du duly returned to full service, becoming home fleet flagship in 1949. She carried 10 Firebrand torpedo attack aircraft and 10 Sea Hornet twin-engine fighter bombers. Quite a, quite a capable core air group. This, this, this left space for a trials 
a training squadron or, if operational required, two dozen or so Sea Furies and Fireflies to add to the air group. A likely carrier's compliment. The new Sea Fury fighters had first gone to sea in Vengeance and Theseus the, the previous autumn. The, flex, the flexible Firefly and improved versions continued to fulfil fighter reconnaissance and light strike roles as a complement to single-seat fighters in the light fleet carrier air groups. A new Sea Fire, the Mark 47, also entered service in 1948 to replace older Marks in light fleet carriers not yet modified with stronger arrestor gear to take the Sea Fury. One such was HMS Triumph, which took them to war off Korea in 1950, where they proved highly competitive with American jets on combat air, air patrol duties. The available carriers had led active lives in the immediate post-war period. Ocean played a major role in the Corfu Channel incident in 1946. Her fireflies were prepared to act as gunnery spotters when the damaged British destroyers were recovered, and the carrier had its sea fires and fireflies bombed up in case the Albanians opposed the sweeping of the Corfu Channel. In 1948, Ocean covered the withdrawal from Palestine. By this time, she had been reinforced by Triumph, and the 2nd Carrier Squadron did a flag-showing cruise in the Western Mediterranean. After an exercise in Triumph uh, with the Americans, the Mediterranean Fleet Commander was, was rather worried about the limited capabilities of his aircraft if war did break out with the USSR. He was reassured that a light fleet carrier could cope with the immediate threat. Triumph now moved to the Far East as the hard-worked ocean was replaced by Glory. The situation in the Far East was deteriorating and Triumph's aircraft struck against communist uh, guerrillas in Malaya in 1949. Her operations off Korea and those of other, other light fleet carriers that replaced her played a major role in the conflict and were the only British combat aircraft used over Korea. A Sea Fury even shot down a MiG-15 jet. This was a major factor in vindicating the carrier force as a vital component of global British air power as the RAF concentrated elsewhere. One important reason for the significant increase in anti-shipping surface strike capability in 1948 was probably the 1947 RAF abandonment of maritime strike and the disbandment of its last Mosquito squadron in this role before it could re-equip with the Brigand torpedo bomber. The, uh, the Royal Navy could now plug this gap with its fleet carrier's aircraft. This would be the basis of a compromise that, uh, that would take the services in, into the next decade and the jet age. A development of a new um, heavy um, heavy attack aircraft uh, with a range of, of, of two to three thousand miles to give it the same kind of nuclear strike uh, capability as the United States Navy had with, it, uh, with its North American Savage was, was, was put on one side. There was talk in naval air circles of carrier-based aircraft hitting targets that RAF Bomber Command couldn't reach, but development was soon stopped, especially as it was clear it would soon be obsolete as jets came along. Long-range long nuclear strike in the, in, the, in the Royal Navy would have to wait for, for another 10 years or more. The, the new First Sea Lord, Lord Fraser of North Cape, who took office in 1948, was no fan of long-range carrier strike. He saw carriers de uh, dealing with air and subsurface threats in defence of merchant shipping in the Atlantic and Mediterranean. This was held to require a front line of 75 day fighters, currently Sea Fire, Sea Furies and Sea Hornets, 28 night fighters, fireflies and sea hornets, and 75 anti-submarine aircraft, barracudas, and a new version of the ubiquitous firefly. Not a competitive long-range strike capability. The av available firebrands, up to three squadrons, it was hoped, along with surface ships, would deal with whatever surface threats appeared. Such capabilities comp uh, 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 complemented the RAFs rather, rather than competed against them. It was a division of labour that Britain could actually afford. Nevertheless, the success of British carriers in, in power projection during limited war operations in the Far East threatened to cause inter future inter-service conflict. A growing factor in naval plans was the advent of jet, uh, jet uh, propulsion. One reason for the delayed completion of the new carriers was the need to further modify the designs to take the next generation of aircraft. As early as December 1945, a de Havilland Vampire prototype landed on HMS Ocean and production was considered. There were doubts, however, about problems with jet wash, high landing speeds, and the Vampire's limited range. Naval aviation was always very range conscious. Twenty modified sea vampires with hooks and strengthened undercarriages and fuselages were ordered in 1947 and were delivered the following year. They equipped two second line squadrons in 1948 to, to, to evaluate the dynamics of jet carrier op operations. They were used in experiments on HMS Warrior, just returned from Earth. 
uh, from Canada and, and fitted with a flexible deck for wheels up landings but this form of op operation was not adopted as although it had some advantages it would slow down operations too much. One of the squadrons uh, of the Vampire Squadrons operated for a period in a more conventional way from the fleet carrier Implacable in late 1949. An interim operational jet fighter was under development, the Supermarine Attacker, but almost inevitably there were development problems and the aircraft didn't ent enter service in Eagle until 1951. The, RA the RN's uh, uh, preference was Hawker's longer range N746, the Seahawk, but again uh, this was delayed by, uh, by the decision to, to, to uh, Sorry, but, but again, the, uh, this was delayed, and the decision to go for the attacker as backup vindicated. Early work was being done by, uh, by Supermarine on a high-speed interceptor N947, which eventually became the N113 Scimitar. The emphasis was, was, was clearly on combat air patrol, although the fighters could be used as fighter bombers. Indeed, the Scimitar became the Royal Navy's first, first, first nuclear strike aircraft. Ferry and Blackburn competed for a three-seat ASW aircraft, the GR-1745, that eventually became the Ferry Gannett. Ferry got the contract, apparently, to compensate them for the cancellation of their strike fighter, in which they had invested a considerable effort, an interesting further substitution of ASW for strike cap capability. Gannets, however, didn't enter service until the end of the 1950s, and interim a a ASW types were therefore required. Given the failure of yet another Firefly variants, the three-seat ASW type, the RN had to go back to the Americans to, to procure the Avenger, now available affordably as military aid, as an ASW aircraft to replace the, uh, the, uh, the obsolete Barracuda and Firefly. America had also provided vital Sky Radar airborne early warning aircraft. American aid was thus again crucial to, uh, to the RN's air power. So the irony was complete. The Royal Navy's aviation had, as it were, steamed a full circle.